Oh, good morning, folks. Um, if you're visiting with us today, um, especially a welcome to you, but you've also jumped straight into um, partway through a series that we've been doing as a church through the book of 1 Corinthians. For the last two weeks, uh, we've had a small break from it, um, but today we're launching back into it. So if you like to sort of get a head start as to where we're up to, 1 Corinthians chapter 12 is the passage that we're looking at. While you're looking for that, just have a think for a moment. I wonder how many times, or if at all, you have ever taken one of those personality assessment quizzes. Taken one of those? A dozen of them, maybe? Depends a little bit about your personality. Some of them are pretty involved, aren't they? Um, some of them have a long process of self-reflection that's required. Um, I did one once um, with a guy. It actually involved a series of questionnaires that I had to fill out, questionnaires that other people that knew me had to anonymously fill out, involved um, an interview with a trained facilitator. It was fascinating. Then, of course, there's those really super accurate ones that you can do on Facebook. All right, 100% true. Believe me, the picture that you choose, that they then tell you all about what you're like because you chose that pot plant over that pot plant or whatever it was, probably tells you more about how much the company Meta that owns Facebook knows about you based on everything that you ever click on, scroll and pause on and watch for a little while. They know a lot about us. I've done a few of those self-assessment type things over the years. Maybe you have too. Usually it's because we're actually quite fascinated with ourselves. Um, we want to know what category we fit into in life. All right? Um, one of the ones that I did, it came with a book. You had to read the book, do the assessment. I even read the book. Um, it was the one, not so much about personality, but... Have you heard about the love language one? Yeah. yeah, some of you have, right? You want to know what love language you are. So let me give you the basic assumption of the book. The basic assumption of the book is that whatever love language you appreciate being loved by is predominantly the one that you tend to love others with. And there are five love languages, okay? Um, words of affirmation is one of them, so saying nice things, using your words. If people say nice things about you and say lovely things about you, it makes you feel loved and appreciated. It's also the way that you tend to operate and you use words of affirmation with other people. The second one is quality time, so just people who want to choose to spend good time. Um, that's how you feel loved. Physical touch, and nearly every man that reads the book and does the assessment, he goes, I don't even need to do the assessment. I already know. Physical touch is my thing, right? Um, words of affirmation, quality time, physical touch. The fourth one is acts of service. So choosing to do something for somebody else is the way that you feel loved and the way that you express love. And the last one is receiving gifts. Uh, gift giving is a love language. And so when I did my assessment, it gives you your two highest ranking love languages for what it's worth. Mine, number one, quality time. All right? If you choose to want to spend time with me, um, just even if you don't talk, in fact, sometimes it's better when you don't. Um, <laughs> if you can comfortably be in each other's presence without even the needing to talk all the time, even necessarily, just being with each other, I feel really loved and appreciated when someone wants to do that with me. Um, and so it means that in general, I, I tend to express my love towards other people by saying, hey, let's get together, let's hang out, let's do something together, let's just sit by a fire somewhere or whatever it is, you know. And the second one that showed up for me was acts of service. When people choose to want to do something for me, to help me with something, unasked, um, unrequested, then I, I feel really appreciated, I feel really loved. And so that's what I tend to do also. You want what was my last one? 
Kath will tell you. My last ranking love language. Um, gifts. <laughs> Gift giving. Look, don't get me wrong. Gifts are nice. But it doesn't really communicate great love and appreciation to me. It's like, oh, it's nice. Nice gift. Thank you very much. That's great. Um, we have a saying in Queensland, I don't know if it's so much down here, but gifts are fairly ho-hum to me. They're nice, but whatever, right? It also means that I, I'm the world's worst tragic gift giver. Like, come to my house, my wife has a thousand smelly candles. I don't know what to get. What do you get? A, a candle that smells kind of nice, right? Or... More recently, I've branched out. Succulents, guys. <laughs> Smelly candles, succulents. You can't go wrong, all right? If you'd have no idea like me, take a leaf out of my book, buy them a succulent. Um, but I'm really bad at, at giving gifts. So when it comes to gifts, I need all the help I can get. And maybe you feel the same as well. Interestingly enough, though, when it comes to spiritual gifts, there seems to be a lot of confusion as well. A lot of misinformation, a lot of uncertainty around the topic of spiritual gifts. And so it's interestingly um, enough that we've launched back into 1 Corinthians chapter 12, and it's where Paul starts to direct his attention now in his letter to the church in Corinth around spiritual gifts, and he's going to do so for the next few chapters. Uh, let me read you some statistics, though. Um, I'll try not to make them boring. Statistics normally are, but... There's an institute called the Barner Institute. They're based in America, and they've been around for a long time. They're a Christian research and reporting organisation in the United States. And they've conducted, over the last 20, 30 years or so, a series of regular... Um, surveys of the church in the US on the subject of spiritual gifts. Now, granted, the US is not the same as Australia. The, if they did the same research here, they'd probably show up a little bit different, but I think, I think what their research shows is a reasonable indication of what many Christians feel on this subject across at least Western nations. Um, two significant observations that I was reading about when they did these research um, surveys over the last 20 years or so. Here's the first lot. Among born-again adults, all right, so adults, born-again Christians, the percentage that say they have heard of spiritual gifts but do not believe that God has given them one jumped from, get this, in 1995, so we're going back a little while now, but 1995... They did that survey. Only 4% of adult born-again believers in the US believed or thought that they had heard of spiritual gifts but did not believe that God had given them one. Only 4%. Five years later, in the year 2000, they did the same survey and they asked the same Christians across the US... That same question, have you heard of spiritual gifts, but do you believe if God gave you one? Instead of 4% in 1995, five years later, that number had gone to 21%. 21% of Christians, born-again adult Christians in the US thought, I've heard of spiritual gifts, but I don't think that God's given me one. The number who say that they're not sure if they have a gift or what it might be, the ones that said, I know what it is, that, that stayed around the same. But then there were the specific gifts that people claimed God had granted to them. They, they changed relatively little as well. But the most commonly identified gifts amongst believers were listed as being teaching, uh, gifts and service, faith, discernment, exhortation and encouragement. They were the most commonly listed um, gifts. Only 3% of the population said that they thought that their spiritual gift was leadership. But here's one of the most startling outcomes that come from it. And it was the number and the range of gifts that were listed 
that are not listed or talked about in the Bible at all. Okay, so there were quite a lot of people who said that their gifts included uh, sense of humour. Right. It's amazing. It's in America too. It's incredible. Um, my American friend might be watching online this morning. Good on you, Ira. Um, I love you, brother. Um, the gift of listening, the gift of patience, uh, the gift of a good personality, friendliness, poetry, the gift of going to church. Yeah. Right? I didn't know that was a gift, actually, but anyway. Um, the gift of being likable, the gift of drawing, here's one, the gift of survival. <laughs> Maybe that was down to the southern parts of the US, I'm not sure. Um, the gift of observation and the gift of being a good person. So in total, there were actually several dozen non-gifts, or at least non-gifts in the sense that the Bible doesn't talk about them as being gifts, that were listed. And so overall, the survey showed that among born-again adults, only 30% of them listed gifts that were found in the Bible. 8% listed a combination of biblical gifts and non-gifts. 16% listed only attributes that are not found in the Bible at all. And nearly half, 46%, were either unaware of gifts, claimed they did not have one, or did not know the identity of their gift. Nearly half. So that was taken 1995 to 2000, okay? That's more than 20 20 years ago. Second observation, and the second survey that I want to mention for a moment, was a study that was completed just in January of this year. January of 2022, the results were released. It was primarily focused on differing attitudes between the various age groups that make up the church. So here, This is a shorter one. Practicing Christian millennials. Um, some of you will be term, used to that terminology, a millennial. Um, then there's Generation X, going back a little bit more. Y. Gen X, there's, what's that, boomers, um, the ones that were born after the war. Um, The newest one is Gen Z, right? Gen Z is the newest one. So anyway, practicing Christian millennials are significantly more likely than older age groups to say that it is extremely important for one to know or understand their unique gifts, skills, and abilities. Our younger Christians are saying, it's really important that we know this. Um, Practicing Christian millennials and Gen Z are more likely than older generations to say that they know what their gifts are, at least reasonably well. Younger practicing Christians, Gen Z and millennials, are significantly more likely to say that they definitely have gifts that they want to develop. And when it comes to people and places who support gift development, practicing Christians in the Gen Z and millennial age groups are more likely to credit small groups with friends and maybe educational environments as places where they can see their gift development happening. But again, only half of practicing Christians in that younger generation name church as a place for gift development. Over the last 20 years, what these sort of statistics tell us is that there's been a lot of confusion around spiritual gifts. Lots of like, well, it's it's so weird to talk about it. Does it mean that we're sort of too proud if we know what our gift is? And it also tells me that there's a younger generation amongst us who are saying, we know it's important and we want to find out what it is, but they're looking, at least half of them are looking in other places and rather than actually developing their gift here in our church. So I think all of that says we've got a lot to learn from what Paul's going to tell us over the next few weeks. All right? We've got a lot that we can listen and ask God. God, show us what we should be doing here as we think well about spiritual gifts. All right, last Sunday, Matt, thank you so much for 
for ministering to us, brother, out of the word. It was, um, I found it really encouraging. And, and last Sunday and the Sunday before, we sort of pulled back from this series in 1 Corinthians and we said, hey, let's just hit a pause on that for a moment. But let's look at the Holy Spirit in, in the sense of big picture. And we talked a lot about relationship with the Holy Spirit. We talked about uh, fruit of the Holy Spirit. We talked about following the Holy Spirit, even grieving the Holy Spirit. The bottom line is, is that we are to walk in step, right, with the Spirit. And He produces fruit in our lives that are an expression of the gospel at work in us and through us. But now we're going to jump back into 1 Corinthians 12. We're going to shift a little bit from fruit to gift. Right? And there's a difference between them. Maybe one way to sort of try and think of that difference is a little bit like thinking about um, character and maybe skill. You know, who you are as a person, your character. When the Spirit's working you, there's a, a fruit that He bears. But then also, He's given us gifts, you. He's given you gifts, abilities, skills that He has supplied. So, let's um, find 1 Corinthians chapter 12. We're only going to focus on the first 11 verses this morning. Um, I've got a friend who lives up in northern New South Wales, northwestern New South Wales. He's going to be visiting with us next week. Alan Moss, his name is. Some of you might know him. Uh, Alan's going to be sharing more about this chapter from verse 12 onwards uh, next week. But we're going to be sort of camped out in this chapter for a couple of weeks. Now, what I want you to keep in mind as we read this, Paul, all the way through this letter, right, he's been dealing with things around false identities, ways that we can think about ourselves both individually and as a church which aren't in line with the gospel. So he talked about, you know, aligning ourselves with um, celebrity preachers. Maybe right back in the beginning of the book, we, we looked at that. I got my identity and worth because I said, oh, I'm with Paul or I'm with Barnabas or I'm with Peter or someone like that. You know, and we can do that with modern preachers today. This is the book I like reading. This is the podcast that I like listening to. This is the preacher that I think's right. And somehow we think better about ourselves because of that. And Paul says, no. You just belong to Jesus. That's all that matters. Bring it on. It's good. That's your identity. The gospel tells you who you are. You don't need that affirmation. Uh, we talked about the ways that we can relate to each other, both in our marriages, um, within our sexuality, within, our, within the relationships that we have in the church even, and, and the ways that we can have false identities about value and worth. Um, we talked a bit about... Um, finding your identity in false positions of superiority. Remember that? Um, driving the, the class conversation from our community and bringing it inside the church and starting to say, hey, you know, how we do communion or whether we wear a hat or something like that. And it was a lot to do with, remember, who's better? You're worse. I'm more important than you type of thing. And Paul says, no, we're all the same in Christ. There's no superiority here. So now Paul, I think, turns to these sort of anti-gospel identities and how they show up in how we think about gifts, how we think about serving one another. And over the next couple of weeks, I think that's going to become more and more obvious. All right, so let's read together. Um, but before I read, let's pray. Lord Jesus, uh, we want to hear your voice. So Holy Spirit, take the words off the page that we're reading and bring them to life in our hearts in such a way that reveal maybe sin, things that we need to get right with you, or just um, poor ways of thinking, and we want to align our thinking and, and have our thinking renewed in you. We want to be transformed people, Lord. We want to be a church that's a transformed church, using the gifts that you've given us well for your purpose. Yes. So help us to hear your voice this morning. Amen. All right, if you can stand or you'd like to stand, why don't you stand with me as we read God's Word. 1 Corinthians chapter 12, starting from verse 1. I'm going to read from the Christian Standard Bible. If you've got something different, follow along. Or I think there's some on the screen, if the screen's working. We've been having some troubles with screens today. All right, verse 1. Now concerning spiritual gifts, brothers and sisters, I do not want you to be unaware. You know that when you were pagans... You used to be enticed and led astray by mute idols. Therefore, I want you to know that no one speaking by the Spirit of God says Jesus is cursed. And no one can say Jesus is Lord 
except by the Holy Spirit. Now, there are different gifts, but the same Spirit. There are different ministries, but the same Lord. And there are different activities, but the same God produces each gift in each person. A manifestation of the Spirit is given to each person for the common good. No one is given a message of wisdom through the Spirit. Oh, sorry, to, to one is given a message of wisdom through the Spirit. To another, a message of knowledge by the same Spirit. To another, faith by the same Spirit. To another, gifts of healing by the one Spirit. To another, the performing of miracles. To another, prophecy. To another, distinguishing between spirits. To another, different kinds of tongues. To another, interpretation of tongues. One and the same Spirit is active in all these, distributing to each person as He wills. This is the Word of the Lord. Amen. All right, why don't you take a seat? All I want to do this morning in the time that we've got is just make five observations about those 11 verses. Okay? Five observations about those 11 verses. We're just going to sort of start at the top, work our way down and sort of try and set the stage, I think, for the next few weeks at least, as we start thinking about the role of the Holy Spirit in this church, not only in how He relates and how we relate to Him, but in particular how He has gifted and equipped this church, churches everywhere, to serve people, to share the gospel well, to make disciples... Okay, so five things to consider as we begin reflecting more on the relationship between the Holy Spirit and the wider activity of the church. Point one, regarding spiritual gifts, ignorance is not an option. That's my first point, first observation that I'll make. I take it from verse one. Paul says, now concerning spiritual gifts, brothers and sisters... I do not want you to be unaware. I mean, those stats that I um, I quoted earlier, roughly 57, sorry, 47% of the population, so almost half of the population surveyed were like, yeah, I don't really know. Don't really know about gifts. I don't really know what that is. I don't know what I've got. I don't know how they operate. Half. I would say just by my conversations and observations over the last 20 years of ministry or so in Australia, I reckon that's probably the ballpark of a lot of Christians, at least in the circles of churches that I, I sort of grew up in. Spiritual gifts could be something that maybe, depending on your church and background as a Christian, maybe you've heard a lot about, or maybe you've heard a lot about a few gifts, and, and there's a lot of other things that you're, you're like, I'm not sure about all of those other ones. Or maybe you've grown up in churches where you talk about spiritual gifts and you sort of start to feel a bit like, are we allowed? Is, you know, that's sort of a bit weird, that sort of stuff, and I don't know about that. And I don't want to get labelled with, you know, different types of labels that Christians put each other on if we start talking about spiritual gifts. But my first point is that when Paul writes this letter to the church in Corinth, he says, I don't want you to be unaware of it. Now, concerning spiritual gifts, I do not want you to be unaware. He wants us to explore this. The Spirit of God, through Paul, is saying to us today, hey, Raymond Terrace Community Church, get to know what I can do among you. Learn about it. Explore it. We don't want to be unaware. Ignorance is not an option for us. That's my first point. Second point is this. God is alive... And he speaks. God is alive and he speaks. There's this kind of little bit of a strange, when I read through it, I thought, man, this is a bit of a strange turn that Paul's taken on. He's obviously finished talking about what he was talking about back in chapter 10, chapter 11, hits chapter 12, verse 1, and he shifts gear and he says, now, concerning spiritual gifts, we go, okay, we're with you, Paul. Paul's going to talk about spiritual gifts here. And even to the point that he says, I don't want you to be unaware. And you're like, good, tell us, Paul, right? Tell us. And then in verse 2 and verse 3, he says, You know that when you were pagans, you used to be enticed and led astray by mute idols. You're like, well, where's he going with this, right? Isn't he going to talk about spiritual gifts? 
Why is he now talking about when you didn't know Jesus, when you were pagans, that means? Why is he now talking about the fact that, hey, you remember how you used to be enticed and led astray by mute idols? Therefore, I want you to know, verse 3, which is interesting because back in verse 1, he says, I don't want you to be unaware. I don't want you to be unaware about something. And now he's saying, verse 3, therefore, I want you to know something. So he's filling in a gap for us. He's filling in a gap that, that maybe we were unaware of. So we, we need to sort of try and follow his logic here a little bit. Therefore, I want you to know that no one speaking by the Spirit of God says Jesus is cursed, and no one can say Jesus is Lord except by the Holy Spirit. Here's what I think Paul's driving at in the logic of this passage, right? God is alive today and he's still speaking. God is alive today and he still has something to say in his church and through his church. God is still active in this world. So he, he contrasts these Christians in Corinth. And he says, listen, before you got to know Jesus, remember what it used to be like for you? You used to sort of get involved in all sorts of religious activity and, and you, know, you were very devout and all the rest of it, but you were listening to mute idols, he said. Gods that had nothing to say because they, had, they could not say anything. They were not gods at all. But he says, but, but following Jesus is different. Walking, walking in the Spirit is actually walking in a living relationship with a living God who is still active in this world today. Yep. Here's what I take from that. When we start thinking about spiritual gifts, so often we jump really quickly to the idea of an ability. Right? Something to, to do, something practical maybe. What we don't see is Paul's emphasis right from the very beginning is actually saying, you know what, part of the way that the church serves each other, part of the way that the church uses their gifts for each other is actually a way that we can see God speaking and alive in this world today. You want to see God at move? You want to see God at work? You want to see God speaking in powerful ways? It's here. Absolutely. But it's also in the way that we live with each other. It's also the way about hearing testimonies from each other, about someone saying, you know what, I've just had to trust God with this. I've reached out to someone because I knew that they could pray. And it's a miracle, right? What were we saying? Were we saying, wow, these people are amazing? That's not what I heard. I heard I'm grateful for these people in my life. What I did hear this morning was God showed up. God was speaking. God was active. God's doing something. I think that's what Paul wants our focus to be right from the outset when we start to talk about spiritual gifts. So, so often, like the old you know, personality assessments, we can become pretty absorbed with ourselves and think, I want to know all about me. I want to know how I tick. And sometimes you can do a gift assessment. There are plenty of those out there as well. And sometimes we can do gift assessments with the same attitude. I want to know all about what my gift is, what I can do. And Paul's saying, no, this is actually about God. Gifts are about God. So the first point was, regarding spiritual gifts, ignorance is not an option. Second point, God is alive and He speaks and he wants to be continuing to do that in the church today. Point three is this. When thinking about gifts, think same but different. Think same but different. Pick it up in verse four. Paul says there are different gifts. So think that different, right? The term different and the, and the term same. Look at where they show up in this passage. There are different gifts but the same Lord. There are different ministries, but the same Lord. There are different activities, but the same God works all of them in each person. All right, so when thinking about gifts, think same but different. What does that tell us? 
It tells us that things will look different. We don't all have to be the same. We don't all have to be the same. Praise God for that, right? It means that our gifts are going to be different from each other. Praise God for that. It means there are going to be different types of ministries in this church, different ways that you can express those gifts as a group. You know, there's going to be ones which are quite public that everyone notices. There are ones that are going to be you know, pretty behind the scenes and, and things just happen. You don't know how they happen, but there are people who are just using their gift in this church. You never see them. There are different types of activities, it says, different, different individual ways that you can actually express those gifts. But Paul says, we don't focus so much on all those differences in comparing them to each other and sort of saying, wow, look at this, compare it to that one. Paul says, you know what? If gifts are being operated in the gift, in the spirit, they might be different gifts, there might be different ministries, there's different activities, but guess what? It is the same God in all of them. The same God. Not some that are more important and less important. Not some that are more prominent and more that ones that we sort of just tuck away behind and say, oh, we don't really talk about those ones. God is at work. It's the same God. The same Spirit. The Spirit that enlivens and enriches is the same Spirit that sometimes says, close your mouth. The, the same Spirit that says, hey, there's more going on here than you see on the surface and giving you a mind to see that. It's the same Spirit that gives the ability to have simple faith that says, I don't understand all of this, but I'm just going to trust God that's got it. It's the same Spirit. The same Spirit. So when thinking about gifts, think same but different. Point four. Point four. A gift through you, but for the church. A gift through you, but for the church. I was going to say a gift through you, but not for you. <laughs> it's not quite right, though, because we do receive great blessing by operating out of our giftedness. But Paul wants to make the priority here, again, not about you, but about the church. So let's read together from verse 7. A manifestation of the Spirit, Paul says, is given to each person for the common good. Just pause there for a moment. A manifestation of the Spirit, an expression of the Spirit is given, underline this in your Bible if you're an underlining person, is given to who? Each person. Each person. I don't know about you and what your experience in church life has been. It's a fairly common thing to feel like you walk into a church and look around the place and think, well, they, those people must be the really spiritual people, right? Those people. And we've all got different categories for who that might be, but whether it's someone who's on stage or whether it's someone who you hear a lot from or someone who just seems to just really be able to say something well. Or, and we think, man, those people must be the really spiritual people in this church, right? Oh, the Spirit's really with them. But Paul says that this manifestation of the Spirit is given to each person. If you know Jesus here this morning, whether you can grasp this or not, let me tell you, it is absolutely 100% true the Spirit of God has given you an expression of Himself, a manifestation of the Spirit, and it has been given to you. Why? Verse 7 tells us. For the common good. All right? He's given you an expression of himself, a manifestation of the Spirit, and he's given it to each person for the common good. It is a gift through you, but it is for the church. And then he gives some examples of them. Verse 8 onwards. To one is given a message of wisdom, and it's come through the Spirit. To another, a message of knowledge by the same Spirit. Right? There's that different and same language that Paul keeps using. To another, faith by the same Spirit. Did you realize that faith was a spiritual gift? 
to another gifts of healing by the same Spirit. We've heard about that this morning. I've seen it here. To another, the performing of miracles. To another, prophecy. To another, distinguishing between spirits. To another, different types of tongues. To another, interpretation of tongues. I think he could have kept on going. The point is not what the gift is. The point is, each person has received a manifestation of the Spirit. Why? To make themselves look particularly good? Right? We could go through that same list. You know, a message of uh, wisdom, a message of knowledge. We could make name badges up, if you like, in our church, right? Once you've passed the gift assessment, <laughs> once you know what your gift is, we give you a name badge. I have the uh, gift of wisdom, or knowledge, or faith. Um, go see our sister over there, she has the gift of healing. Performing of miracles, the prophecy, tongues, interpretation, whatever it is. I don't think Paul's making a point here about what the gift is. He's just saying that the gift was given, yes, but it wasn't given directly for your benefit. It was given for everybody else's benefit. It was for the common good, Paul says. Same spirits at work, right? And the same spirit loves his church and he's saying, how can I build this church up to look more and more like Jesus? How can this church become more and more effective in their proclamation and declaration of the hope that we find in Jesus? How can this church be hands and feet in this community and look more and more like Jesus? How can that happen? And the Spirit says, man, I've got big plans for this church. And I'm going to need everyone on board. I'm going to need everybody doing their part. I'm going to need everybody. It's, it's all going to look different. Your gift is going to be different to that gift. In fact, I hang around and talk to a lot of people with the gift of teaching. I try and learn from them, learn about their experiences. One of the things I've been, is very interesting, the gift of teaching or the gift of encouragement or the gift of hospitality, whatever other gift you want to think of, I know lots of people who have that same gift, but even the same gift can look different, yeah. right? I know people who are brilliant Bible teachers from the pulpit and pretty average in a small group. I know other people who are just profound Bible teachers in a one-on-one -on -one conversation. Yeah. But they don't want to nor feel comfortable or struggle in the sense of expanding the same truths in this type of setting. Maybe hospitality is something that you've said, you know what, I feel so comfortable just making my home a place where people can say, I just feel like I belong here. That's a real gift of hospitality that you might have. Other people might have a real gift of hospitality where they can just see a need and extend their possessions and their goods to enter the, into that need and embrace that person. Maybe they'll never step into their lounge room. It's still a gift of hospitality. There's all sorts of ways that our gifts can be expressed, but it's the same spirit and it's for everybody else's good. Yeah. So here's our last point before we're done. Point five. Gifts are given at the discretion of the giver. Cool. All right? Gifts are given at the discretion of the giver. Verse 11. One and the same Spirit is active in all of these, distributing to each person as He wills. As He wills. Now, granted, elsewhere, we won't turn to it today, we will cover it in the weeks ahead. Paul says, you can desire gifts. You can think, man, I would love to have this particular gift. And there's nothing wrong with even telling God that. God, could you give me the gift for this? I would love to serve in this direction. And maybe even your desire for it is an indication of the sort of gifting that you have. But what gift we're given is not up to us. The Spirit gives gifts as He wills. Why? Because He knows what this church needs. He knows us better than we know ourselves. He knows the mission this church needs to engage with. 
He can see the needs. He can see the tasks. He can see what is required. And so he will say, I'm going to give this gift to this church. I'm going to do it through this person and this gift and this gift and this gift. And they're all going to be different. But it's because he knows what's best for us. So they're simply my five observations. There are more things that we could take out of this passage and explore, I know, but in the time that we've got, five observations. The one thing that I want you to see most of all, if I could sum it up, here's how I would summarise the passage. Pursue and practise the gift God has given you by the Spirit. That's, That's my take on Paul's command, Paul's desire out of this passage. Pursue and practice the gift that God has given you by the Spirit. If you do, God will be honoured and the church will be blessed. Now, we will get on to what happens if we don't in weeks ahead. We will get on to what are the the most important things that should underpin gifts. We're going to look at that in weeks ahead. Surprise, surprise. 1 Corinthians chapter 13. It's a nice thing to read at weddings. It's actually all about gifts. But we'll get there. Let's pray. Lord, thank you that you are a gift-giving God. Um, When we look at our own resources, what we can do on our own experience, our own abilities, our own flesh, it takes us a certain way, but so often we fall short. There is a spiritual work to be done in this world through your church and you have given us spiritual gifts to accomplish it. So Lord, help us to think well about this. Help us to not be unaware about spiritual gifts, especially what gifts you have given us. Lord, help us to be honest and explore it and pursue you and practice the gifts that we have been given Lord, not for our sake, but so that your church would grow and be blessed by it and your name would be honoured. That's our prayer. And so we ask that you would help us this week and the weeks ahead. In Jesus' name, amen.